Robert England here, a.k.a. Freddy Krueger. This is Burning for Springwood. Ah, uh, yes, hello. We're back again. Uh, Burning for Springwood. N- not your definitive Freddy's Nightmares podcast, but it's one of them. I've no, I've noticed there's been other ones, but you know what? Whatever, bro. Uh, it's hot as hell here, man, in the boiler room. Even hotter in, in NorCal. Nah, I think they're boiling to a little bit hotter, man. Is the man who uh, mastered disaster, well, the disaster, you know, area, he's, he causes earthquakes and shit, man, with his mind. Uh, yeah. M- Mike Merriman's here. How you doing, sir? Hey, what's up, man? Yeah, I haven't actually felt the aftershocks of an earthquake in years. Cal- you know, California is notorious for them, but realistically, most earthquakes, like the majority, are so mild, no one ever knows about them. Uh, you, you know, you'd have to actually look them up to know they happen. But today, about an hour away, I guess there was a 5.9 and then a 4.8 and not not enough to do any damage in the cities. Um, but I, I definitely felt something in my chair and the th- the funny thing was it wasn't very intense. It didn't put a scare in me, but it lasted long enough to where I kind of triple question myself it was it it sort of went like hey what's that to is that an earthquake nah it's not and then wait is it (laughs) um so yeah it was it was interesting my my kids didn't feel it or if they did they probably had no idea like what it was they're you know they're young they're always moving around anyway but uh yeah uh other than that just your standard what thursday is it (laughs) So, I, yeah, I had my excitement for the day. I mean, unless, of course, you count uh, the episodes of Freddy's Nightmares, which are always exciting, right? Oh, most definitely exciting. I'm glad everybody's safe. I, I had to bring it up, man. So it's real-world real, real world, uh, stuff here. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in the room with the with the Duchess right now. So if you hear her meow, she, 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 she wouldn't leave me alone. So, you know, yeah, that goes. Uh, S- Suzanne is not with us tonight. Uh, I do have her thoughts on... The two episodes we're going to do uh, claim she was exhausted from not sleeping for the last two days. I wonder if our our mystery, you know, man, the the, the son of a hundred maniacs is, is haunting her dreams at this point. He could, he could be, you know, threatening mm-hmm. her with, with poor work conditions, like working for a commission and nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, speaking of which, we're going to get to our first episode, uh, which is episode 17 of the very first season, which is called Love Stinks. Adam's about to meet the girl of his dreams, but this fatal attraction is more than just a one-night stand. Tell me you love me. It's what every girl wants to hear. She'll do anything to score. He's mine now. Falling in love means never having to say you're sorry. Adam better learn the look of love. On the next Nightmare on Elm Street, the series Freddy's Nightmares. Yeah, Love Stinks uh, premiered February 25th, uh, just after Valentine's Day, of course, in uh, 1989. Directed by one John Lafia, who, if you don't know the name... This is a guy who wrote Child's Play, uh, directed Child's Play 2, and directed Man's Best Friend. I love all three of these things. So this episode, we'll find out if we love it or not. I don't know. It's, it's a <laughs> uh, your, basic, your basic plot, uh, which has two plots that are sort of inter- entertained because you're supposed to think that he's in a nightmare. So I'd imagine this is a continuing nightmare. Uh, after Teenager Adam is coerced into cheating on Laura... Tamara Glenn, who you may know as the Red Devil Girl in Halloween 5. Uh, not the cookie woman, but, you know, some other woman who shows her boobs in the movie. Uh, with Lonnie, a girl he met at a party, he finds that she's looking for more permanent, more than a permanent, more, a more permanent relationship. Uh, i.e. she stalks him in a way, kind of. 
Uh, meanwhile, Adam's friend Max is forced to abandon his planned summer trip. It's 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 still it's still his friend. Whatever. Uh, take a job at a pizza place working under his creepy tyrannical uncle, which is actually his brother. Wiki had this wrong. Uh, Jeffrey Combs plays the brother, the older brother who who's always uh you know better than the younger brother, You're always besting him. And uh, yeah, Mike. Uh, initial thoughts on the episode, sir. Well, you know, as I was watching this one, my first thought was, did we already cover this episode? Because I'm starting to see a pattern, and maybe it's just because a lot of slasher movies deal with, you know, teenage-aged storylines and stuff. But I swear there's already been, like, a handful of episodes with a love triangle. And I swear there's already been a couple episodes involving a pizza place. Now... I could be confusing other anthology shows of the time because I remember I think there was like a Tales from the Crypt where there was like a diner maybe that had a similar twist going on about the secret sauce or secret ingredients. Well, so the, I could the, be the diner. What you're talking about, I think, is um the one um Tales from the Crypt. I think it starred Christopher Reeve, where Judd Nelson yeah. worked for them and he was killing hobos on the street and, and killed their landlord to make steaks. For this, for this, uh, yeah, this squid restaurant, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it's a typical teenage love triangle, kind of in like a nightmarish uh, scenario. You know, he, the, what jumps out at me, it's kind of funny because it's like. The main, or I guess the girl he cheats with. Okay, first of all, she's the aggressor. She knows he has a girlfriend, I think. Yet, after the deed is done, it's like she is demanding, like, they're instantly in love. Like, it's almost like a borderline fatal attraction thing where there's, like, no justification for her actions after the fact, but... You know, it's a, it's a horror show, so, you know, she has to go crazy. There's lots of uh, nightmare fuel stuff, of course, messing with his head. And there's actually a pretty good effect uh, when he wakes up the next morning and, like, they're conjoined. Um, that's, like, typical nightmare on Elm Street-looking stuff right there. Oh, and, it's so and nasty. Like, oh, I'll, I'll separate us if that's what you want, and, you know get some decent blood there um but i mean ultimately this opening story the first half it's it's very kind of standard not much to it that you wouldn't expect um i will i you know i will say i like the effects in it um but i i I guess the ending kind of fell or the ending to this first story kind of fell flat it was just really nothing you as soon as like the the parents bust in and they're like oh but her daughter's here it's like gee i wonder who that's gonna be and it doesn't really like it doesn't really end with the daughter saying or doing anything bad it's just the main character's face reaction like oh no like that kind of thing but um i'll say it wasn't bad it was just very kind of like a standard story not a whole lot to it Yes, this is this is split up into two. I think I should like throw in my little my little jam of thoughts in the first part of this one too, because it does do that thing that you know you either love or hate. I, which I'm fine with both parts of this this episode. They don't really go together, but um, not many of these do go together. Um, yeah, I I I, I dig it. Okay, because you I, I've been in a relationship or two, you know, where that could, that could be the hardest thing to say, you know, because you're, you're, that's, that's a heavy commitment to say, you know, this is somebody that I love, and to say the words at times is really hard for, especially for a douchey guy like this who, mom and dad said I could have a party, that doesn't make you the cool kid in town guy, just throw it out there with mom and dad so you could have the party, and, um, I, I love the, the little shit in this, like, like you mentioned, the, um, well, the big shit. Be, being them literally joined at the hip in a nightmare situation, it's so fucking nasty. It's like he reaches down, he feels he feels something, which is like a, like a I don't even know, like a some kind of slime, and all, all of a sudden he pulls it up. It's almost like he felt the wet spot or something. He put like oh yeah here, here, here. yeah, and he looks down and there's that fucking it's a, it's a nasty effect. It's a really nasty it's effect. Almost like an umbilical cord. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah. 
and um, I love the parents in this episode because the whole time when they come home, dad's missing a finger for no for no for no reason. You know, until they explained, uh, by the way, your father fucked up too, so I, t- I took a finger. And this is all a part of his nightmare, of course. I'm sure all the all this little thing is, because that's what the show's about, you know. You fall asleep, you dream some weird shit. I, is it still happening in the dream? Yada, yada, yada. But like like Mike said, it's very, it's very formulaic, you know. This girl's kind of just there to say, hey, you couldn't tell your girl I love you, so you know what? Let's do it. But he later he wakes up next to his girl and yeah, you know, then the nightmare, yada yada yada. The guilt is there and it's all about guilt. Especially when you get to the end and they bring the friend of the family or whatever this person's supposed to be and it it's her surprise, you know. And he's still circling that same nightmare, which I, I, I can appreciate an ending like that where you have a show that's about him being in a nightmare and he's still just repeating the same nightmare over and over again in different scenarios and yeah, it's, it's it's not it doesn't suck. Let's put it that way. Uh, <laughs> the second part of the episode, though, Mike, uh, what what happens next? So we get, um, I guess it's Adam's friend. That's how they connect it. His friend Max. Um, and that's another thing because you know by now, if if we have listeners that are coming back for multiple episodes, it's already clear that most of these, I, I, it might be all of them. Uh, there's always two stories. I, I would almost say the show would have been better off. I Like, the two different stories is fine, but I'm like, you don't even need to find, like, a character from the first story to connect to the second one. Just do two completely different stories. We don't need, like, a loose connection. Because <laughs> sometimes, like, the fact that there's a holdover character into the second story, you think that it's going to, like, be continuing something from the first story. And it it takes you a few minutes or even like the first segment to realize, oh, they were in the first story, but this is a totally new story. Now, for us, we're kind of used to it by now because we've been watching these. But, you know, for someone turning on the show for the first time, it's it's it can be jarring. Like, wait, what? This guy was in the first story, but I don't know what the hell is going on now. So um, but anyways, yeah, so basically, here comes our classic, like, oh, what's going on in the pizza shop or diner or cafe that's uh, nefarious? Like, my boss is kind of a, you know, a hard-ass boss, but uh, there's something that's successful about his secret ingredients. And, gee, what does a secret ingredient turn out to be? I don't think people will be surprised when they find out what it is. But I thought this episode was pretty good, too. I mean... You kind of saw it's another situation where, like, it's not really something we haven't seen before. I mean, there was like we brought up Tales from the Crypt already. There was there was like literally stories like this going on at the same time, like in that same era of like late 80s horror TV. But with that said, I mean, Jeffrey Combs, I mean, it's never a bad thing to see him. And he does his thing, plays it well. And overall, I still liked uh, this second one, too, you know, and I, I kind of like the end when Max, you know, Max kind of goes from like a irresponsible teenager that's just doing the job out, out of somewhat being forced to. And by the end, he he's totally bought into like the method and how to uh, be a successful pizza shop owner using the famous secret ingredients. It's all in the sauce, baby. It's all in the sauce. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, this one, this one's fun. I mean, I don't, I don't know what, what's going on at the beginning of this episode with the whole S and M. You're going to get a job. Your, your parents have this this guy whipping you to to say, "Okay, I'll finally get a job." That must be his weird, freaky dream that maybe he's into some weird sex things with his parents. I I, I don't know what's going on there, but uh, it is it is what it is, you know and. Yeah, I've been forced to get this job at the place that used to be the the, 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 the Burger Boy for from like the first couple episodes, and of course there was murders that happened there, so they they retooled it into a pizza place, and you know it, just as soon as he's able to get ahead, because I think his brother, played by Jeffrey Combs, got him this job. He got him this job, and he, he's of course you know the the, the fuck up. He's fucking up on purpose. He's messing up deliveries. He's doing this. He's doing that. Just so he can get fired and get away from his shitty older brother. 
He was always more successful than he is. He seems to be one up all the time. And then he finds some success into having some like I, I guess like after hours pizza parties, but his friends come buy all the pizza, so he's making some money there and this of course is messed up by by brother again and like Mike mentioned it's his secret ingredient, like where will all my friends go? Well your friends are in the pizza now and that's what's going on in this episode that Jeffrey Combs who's just devouring the scenery in this episode, he's the really the real big saving grace this episode. And He's feeding his friends to to him and the, the, the patrons, and they making record money while he's working on commission for twelve dollars a week or something, <laughs> you know, because his brother swoops in and takes all the time. Um, I kind of like the ending of this episode too, to to where it was, you know the uncle, you know, who, who sets the oven too high. It's 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 known in the, in the beginning of the episode that this is an old oven; you can't let it go as high as high as this goes, and it goes too far, kind of like the original ending of The Shining, to where the boiler gets too hot and blows up. And I guess the explosion causes maybe them to switch bodies, because now Max has ambition, and he wants to be the same boss as, as his brother. And he used that secret ingredient, re- like Mike said. And I uh, I, I dug it quite a bit. I, and as, it doesn't work as well as, as the next one, because... You got some something going on. We'll talk about it in just this next little bit here. Um, but I, I, I like both segments, just not together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the thing. It's like it, it's it's always an interesting choice the way they'll usually use a crossover character, but then the story oftentimes has no relation at all. So it. it it's kind of jarring or just disjoint. It always feels disjointed and it takes you like a second to like get into the second story. Yeah. That's a real detriment to this one. I got to find Suzanne's thoughts real fast. Cause she's not here tonight, but she gave us her thoughts on these episodes and a uh, real, real short and sweet on that. And, uh, I'm gonna get to that right now. See the my text messages, brother. That's some shitty music for you guys to listen to while I open it up. <laughs> okay, uh, Suzanne says, Love stinks. Crazy Jeffrey Combs made it watchable, like we said, but the story was lame. Uh, this is a keep it in the boiler rating for her, which is the mid range. It's been a while since you guys been on the show, so we'll explain all again. And um, which our rating system is best. Uh, a good one is Welcome to Prime Time, bitch middle range is keep it in the boiler and the, ooh, what was the last one it's flaming piss resurrection was was the worst of the worst and uh, that's where i'll kick it to you mike next and ask you uh any final thoughts on love stinks and what is your rating sir um i no nah, final thoughts i would say you know ignore the fact that the two stories don't really relate in any way other than the one character that kind of takes over as the main guy in the second story. Um, but otherwise, I am actually going to go out there and say this is the Welcome to Prime Time episode because how how long has it been since we've liked both stories in one episode? And I, I thought both of these stories, while not, you know, nothing surprising about them, nothing new, but we're also talking about something that's, what, 30-plus years old now, so... I wouldn't expect watching it, you know, in 2021 to feel fresh or new anyway. Um, So when it comes to this type of stuff, I will I will favor good over needing to be original because it's original is a lot harder to do now, Um, even then, really. But, uh, yeah, I I enjoyed both uh, of the stories in episode 17. So, yeah, that's going to be my rating. Yeah, I'm right there with you. It, it is one of the better ones. Uh, like I said, separately, it's better. Uh, welcome to prime time, bitch, or fuck the prime time, bitch. I forget which one it is. Whatever you guys choose to, the vernacular you guys choose to use, it is one of the top ones of of uh, these 17 episodes we've covered so far. Uh, but the next one we're going to cover is called The Art of Death. Jack's in love with a campus queen. If I just had the guts to show her my stuff. But her boyfriend doesn't believe the pen is mightier than a sword. Let's see if you can draw with hamburger for a hand. So Jack's gonna sketch up a little revenge. 
by entering Freddy's drawing room. Where I'm sure he'll find plenty of inspiration. <laughs> on the next Freddy's Nightmares. Yeah, this one uh, features uh, not Styles from Teen Wolf 2 shows up in this uh, Stuart Freck and I, I don't want to call him that because I think he's just as good as the original Styles from Teen Wolf in my opinion. But um, yeah, your cheapo plot synopsis for this is a young artist comic is brought to life. That's a real cheap. And the second part, which is pretty pretty important to the first part. It kind of really go together this time around, which is a nice change. A claustrophobic woman, which is was the woman he was after, is tormented by her roommate's friend. Um, this is a movie about a guy who's an artist. Uh, a show about a movie, an episode about a guy who's an artist who uh, gets a job, you know, doing art for for a newspaper, uh, the, the campus newspaper, and it comes with this character called the Phantom. And um, the Phantom, you know, as you as you would in in, in these episodes. Uh, he goes to sleep, and the Phantom comes to life, and and starts to uh, do bad things as as he draws them again. This has been done on Tales from the Crypt before with with Harry Anderson, to where he was a Tales from the Crypt artist, mm-hmm. and his creations are brought to life. That that is a better episode than this episode, but I, nonetheless, I, I I like this one okay too. Uh, starts starts killing people as he as he, as he draws them. Uh, falls in love with this girl who has a boyfriend who bullies him. Of course, you're gonna dispatch the bully. And then we get to the the conclusion, the obvious conclusion, of um, which we'll talk about when we discuss the episode. But Michael, uh, the art of death, um, we could do it as a whole because this goes together. Because the the girl, the, the 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 girl he's after, is traumatized by these events in the second part of this episode. So uh, shoot it to me, brother. Yeah, this this actually feels more. Um cohesive like the second part is like a straight epilogue almost to the first story so that's kind of refreshing there because that doesn't happen too often um as far as this goes the you know i will concentrate on the first half i i once again i liked it um i thought uh it like you pointed out another thing that's been done in the same era in Tales from the Crypt, but um, y- y- what this also kind of reminded me of was the the comic book guy from um, Dream Child, I believe it was, and I think, because this episode came out in 89, and I think the Dream Child came out right in that era too, maybe like 88, 89. Yeah, the... the maybe the, the, 90, but I... Th- yeah, 89. April 29th, 1989, so it was right around the same time, and yeah, the, the so character he he the created was a remind me of that guy. The the <laughs> Phantom Prowler yeah. he created. Uh huh. It it kind of made me think of that. Almost like this was like an extended version of that guy's story <laughs> in a way. They they even had the same effect, although much more cheaply done. But but the the effect of him getting pulled into like his drawing board um, for a nightmare uh, that was cool. Um, I, you know, I've always got a kick out of the stories of, you know, my drawings come to life. I mean, like you said, the Tales from the Crypt. I remember there was a segment on Amazing Stories with the world. I think it was World War II pilot where he had to draw like the animated landing gear wheels. Yep. He was, he was stuck, was stuck in the, he, he was stuck in the gunnery, uh, the, the lower gunnery yeah, thing. Crushed. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's other examples obviously of the, of this type of thing but you know I'll, I'll repeat what i said about the first the other episode we covered do it well and I, i'm not really concerned that it's been done before you know as long as you you can do it well and put your own kind of interpretation and characters and you draw me into the story fine i mean how many how many time out of all the t- movies and tv shows and books or comics we read these days how many times can you truly say i've never seen or heard something like this before so i'm not going to hold that against you know a low budget anthology show um but yeah i i was a fan of this episode and i liked the way it ended like you know totally uh victim of the nightmare uh getting stuck in it and it kind of reminded me of uh, the fly when he's kind of yelling at everyone, you know, in the help me, help me. But <laughs> yeah, everyone is oblivious. 
Yeah, it was neat, man. I, I love the, that idea. Like, like you mentioned, him going into the page and becoming his character. That's that's the big twist in the episode that he's the one that's been doing all these murders as the Phantom, and he's got the the, the lady that shows up in you know that's that's that the major part of the the second part of this episode. Uh, stuck in a hole like she, she's the lady from Silence of the Lambs or something, you know, in a warehouse somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, really well done though. I mean, I, I love, I love the, the the desperation of the character. I love uh, the style of the character and the whole idea of him being the bullied and you know him get, getting his revenge. You know, whether he realizes it or not, he's he's getting his revenge for being bullied by. Basically, going up some, the skirt of another guy's that they say, "Hey, you know, I want this girl, but guess what? Here's the opposing force, and that's gonna die on a treadmill." And uh, hilariously, <laughs> but um, mm-hmm. yeah, the end though was pretty awesome, leading into the the second part, which is the girl that he, um, whether willingly or or did not know, he was ter- terrorizing is uh out, out of whatever facility she she had to go to after all this torment and she she's ready to go she's got her meds she she's going to go live with her roommate but she's uh she's being she's being pursued by this dude who, who wants a book out of the apartment or something so he's just like being like over, overly sexual with her the whole time and this is Freddy's nightmares after all, so who knows if this is the way it's happening or not? But she keeps going in on a loop and on a loop, and it's a uh, it's a great it's a great nightmare tale for a woman who's seen some 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 trauma, and I imagine um, this this is how a person like that would react to this said trauma you know, by hallucinations and bad dreams and stuff. Mm-hmm. But what do you think, Mike? Yeah, I thought the second episode was kind of a naturally good transition off the first episode. This was one where it felt like you take a character uh, from the first, but actually make it make sense how you're veering the story off to them, as opposed to, you know, just, okay, we're going to take a character and totally go in another direction, not even acknowledge anything from the first uh, half happened. Um, I will say I felt it kind of dragged a little, uh, you know, not a whole lot went on until that is that my man, Doug Flutie showed up because <laughs> <laughs> when that guy first showed up, I, I was like, is that Doug Flutie? The, the quarterback, I was like this, in the late eighties, this would have been what the, his UFL or what, or was he a CFL guy back, back then before he got back to the NFL? Um, oh, I forget now. <laughs> but yeah, once he showed up, it was basically like the rest of the play, or rest of the running time was just him harassing her the entire time. Um, yeah, I didn't. While I did appreciate kind of like what they did with the, with uh, the character in this one, I still much preferred the first half. It, it was a lot more fun to me than than this one. It was just more kind of like psychoanalyst half of the episode where let you know let's go over the trauma but there wasn't I, I didn't feel like there was a ton they did with it but it was okay it was okay oh i agree you know the second half was in the first half was much stronger than the second half but i guess if they needed to throw something in there when they, they did this thing they did this thing like do every other episode take this and it's not even tertiary characters this is the main character from from the first part which made the second part better that it just wasn't like this rando person in the episode. And um, it wasn't as good as the, as the first part, but it, it, it worked as a second part, which I can say that for 80% of these episodes, as they they go together in, in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man, I forgot to mention this was directed by one Ken Wiederhorn again. He does a lot of these. He helps write a lot of these. Um... This is the guy that gave us Return of the Living Dead Part 2. Um, not, not a whole lot going on here in the second half, though. And I, But that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm glad they're connected in a way that makes it's, make, it makes them being together, these stories together, make sense in a way. And uh, any, uh, any last thoughts on the episode, Michael? And uh, we'll move on to ratings. Um, I will say this one is a very cohesive 
45 minutes while I, you know, while I definitely thought the first half was stronger. At least this one gives you a logical reason why they, why they chose a certain character to continue on. And it makes perfect sense, the story they gave that character. So you have to give some kudos to that. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm going to say, uh, what is it, keep it in the boiler. This is a really good, strong first half. Okay, second half. So uh, not quite welcome to primetime. Yeah, Suzanne, uh, on the other hand, says, where is she, where is she at right here? Second one, much more fun. Love the story and the end. Welcome to primetime, bitch, is her rating for this one. As Willis would say, bitched, you know. Uh, we had to get him on here one time just to talk shit about these sometimes. Uh, anyway, my rating, um, I, I dug it quite a bit, and I, I like that the, the stories went together. It's a big, strong, big, strong set for this one. Even though it's the second story was not the second part of the story was not as good as the first part of the story because you know who, who doesn't love art that comes to life and kills people everybody loves that and watching a horror anything um, I I gotta give it to the, the welcome the prime time bitch rating that Suzanne gave because it's cohesive and that's rare in this situation you know oh my gosh but uh, next up there's there's Dutch to get crying I'm gonna leave that in the show. Uh, we have episodes 19 and 20 uh, coming up in the next episode. One's called Missing Persons. The other one's called Light at the End of the Tunnel. It involves uh, actor Timothy Bottoms. It, it, it sure was a tertiary character in the first part of the episode. He's the biggest actor in that episode. And um, Light at the End of the Tunnel has has Duchess making noise. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't really say in the wiki, damn it. But um, hopefully they're as good as this one. But that one says a man tries to overcome his fear, overcome his fear of the dark after getting a job in a sewer. And uh, the second part is a pornographic store owner becomes trapped in his nightmares. So I'd imagine, you know, I, I don't even know, man. It's weird. Uh, Michael, you got some stuff to push there. Do it now, sir. All right. So we just recorded the latest fresh cuts on the first part of the Fear Street trilogy that's now streaming on Netflix. So definitely by the time you're listening to this, that'll be available. Um, For those that aren't familiar, Fresh Cuts is a sister podcast to the main podcast, Fresh Cuts. We basically cover uh, new releases. Um, Now that theaters are open, we're getting back out to them sometimes. So, you know, for some episodes, the movies will literally be brand new releases. When there's not something in the theater, we'll look through what's available on VOD through all the services and try to get something, you know, as as new as possible. But uh, there's actually a pretty good built up cache of movies now. So we'll it's always better when we can look through movies and make a choice how we want to, as opposed to like, this is the only thing available uh, to new. So that's a weekly podcast and no more room in hell is the main show. Uh, that's, uh, your kind of basic news, uh, hot topics and movie reviews where we just pick a move, pick a couple movies to talk about, um, for no other reason than whoever's turn it is to pick feels like picking them. Um, and then last for me is Theme Warriors, which is a monthly show where we pick a movie theme and then the four co-hosts pick a movie that fits within that theme and we discuss them. Um, those are my main shows. I will, I'm will. i actually participating in uh, the podcast Under the Stairs' is summer series this year. So if you're not tired of me but yet, check me out on the 2014 episode, which will be recorded in a couple of weeks. And then I am an adjudicator for 2019, so I get my I get to throw my hat in the ring a couple times in different uh, different roles. So hopefully, uh, oh, I'm sure it'll be a fun time, but um, can't wait to do it. So that's it for me. Yeah, me uh, Legion uh, Legion podcast. Uh, yeah, you can find Cinema Beef, two Jake Minimum commentaries. Those are the ones that you know on LegionPodcast.com. Brand new show. Last Call of Torchies, 
which is a, a show, and I haven't seen any podcasts do this, that I've let out, and I've Googled this, uh, cover the uh, a comprehensive look at uh, cinema renaissance man Walter Hill, who's a writer, director, producer. He, does, he wears many hats. We're doing his whole, his whole catalog, and it's going to be a lot of fun uh, with Lee Russell and, and Cameron Scott. Uh, Blood from the Core is a thing I do with Derek uh, Boo Boo Bourgeois, which is a Legion Patreon exclusive. We have, by the time you hear this, we'll probably have two episodes out or close to. Um, that's a show that's all New York City horror and thriller based uh, movies. And um, I, let's reverse that. Uh, I'm tired. But <laughs> um, besides that, I am on the Summer Series 2. Uh, 2012 is the year that I am going to be on, and I am adjudicating 2014. As if Duncan need any more vilification, brother. Proud of you, though, sir. I would never want your job. I would never want all that, that planning and scheduling and... Fuck, man. Just think about me. It's my head hurt. I, I can't do it, man. But, uh... We'll see you guys all next time, and, um... As usual, we'll keep the old home fires burning. And, uh... Right here in the boiler room.